So this is a course about analysis. And the structure of this course, we will first introduce the real and complex number field. And then we use metric space. We use metric space and topology definitions to build up our tool to analyze problems. And then we're gonna learn sequence and series continuities and after continuity we jump into differentiation and after differentiation we're gonna discover integration and then in the integration chapter we will find out the most the fundamental theorem of calculus which is the relationship between differentiation and integration they are inverse operations and after that we will do some sequence and series of functions it's a little bit extra and the first thing we have to do we, we have to um, build up build up our theory of ordered sets so basically first we have to know that if s is a set an order on s is a relation such that for any two elements only one one and only one of the statements must be true and second for any three elements such that x less than 1 and y less than z, then x must be less than z. <coughs> and then we take a look at the statement x less than or equal to y is, e is equivalent as x less than y and x or 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 x equal to y. And the negation of the statement is x greater than y. Now, if a, you have a set and you have an order being defined on the set, then the set S is called an ordered set. And when we define ordered set, we want to define when we're ordering label things, we always sometimes we have like the biggest elements which we can use to define our upper bounds. So if S is an order set and then E is a subset of S. And if there's a beta in S such that for any X and Z we have this relation holds. So for any X and Z exists beta in S such that for any x and e, we have x less than or equal to beta, less than or equal to beta. Then we call it e is bounded above. And the, the beta is called the upper bound of e. Similarly, with the lower bounds, just replace the less than or equal to sign with the greater than or equal to sign. So basically, a subset E of S exists beta and S such that for any X and E, X is greater than or equal to B beta, or beta is less than or equal to all the X and E. <coughs> then beta is called a lower bound. And when we have lower bound and upper bounds, we want to find a thing that's called the least upper bound, also the greatest lower bound. So you have many, for example, a set here, points here. This is the upper bound. This is the upper bound. This is the upper bound. But we want to find the least upper bound. What that means. So let me define this. So we have the ordered set S and the subset of S, which is E, and E is bounded above. So if there's an alpha such that it satisfies, first of all, this alpha is the upper bound. And also, if gamma is less than alpha, then this gamma is not an upper bound of E anymore. Then the alpha is called the uh, least upper bound of E, or the supremum of E, and we denote it like this. And similarly, the greatest lower bound, or infimum, we 
right like this. And the greatest lower bound means that if a number is greater than the alpha, then this number bigger than alpha is not in lower bound of E anymore. And the supremum of the set may or may not be in the set. For example, all rationals less than zero and all rationals less than or equal to zero. They have the same lower bound, namely zero. But zero is in the set that's less than or equal to zero, but it's not in the set that are the rational that are less than zero. <coughs> and now we define a set having a lower bound least upper bound property if if any subset not empty any non empty subset of s such that e is bounded above then we have the supreme of this set e exists in s this is called the least upper bound property for any, for any subset of S that's not empty and bound above, then this subset has a least upper bound exist in S. And now, similarly for lower bounds, a least a greatest lower bound property is said that for any subset of S non empty bounded below, below, then the infimum exists in S. <laughs> and the next theorem will discover the relationship between the least upper bound property and the greatest lower bound property. And it states that if a set has a least upper bound property, then it also has the greatest lower bound property. So which means we only need to define the least upper bound property, then the set automatically has the greatest lower bound property. And there are a few of the techniques going to be used in the proof of this theorem. First is called the contrapositive statements. So for example, if you want to prove that P implies Q is true, we, we can simply show that the negation of Q implies the negation of P is true. They are logically equivalent. And also the proof by contradiction, which is if you know a statement, if you want to prove P is true, P is true. If you want to prove that P is true. But you assume that P is false. And that gives you something ridiculous. That gives you something that's nonsense. Then we have to assume that, uh, then we know that P must be true. Because if, if we assume it's false, then something nonsense in mathematics can happen, which is not allowed. So the statement must be true. Okay. So. Let's take a look at the theorem. If S is an order set with the least upper bound property, and B, the subset of S, not empty, that's bounded below, and we define L being the all lower bounds of B, then the supremum of the lower bounds exists in S, such that it is equal to the infimum of B. So which means that a theorem of B exists in S. So, in summary, it says that if S is an order set with least upper bound property, then a theorem exists in S, which is it has the greatest lower bound property. Property. All right. So let me prove it. The proof. We know that B is bounded below. That implies L is not empty. <clears throat> C 
So for all, we know that for all y and l, for all y and l, l is the lower bound, the set of lower bounds of b. So for all y and l, we have y is less than or equal to x for all x and b. Simply the definition of lower bounds, right? And now we see that for all y and l, oh, and we know that b is non-empty. b is non-empty. b is non-empty means that there is, there exists x and b such that for all y and l, y, uh, y is less than equal to x. This means that l is bounded above. And also, L is a subset of S. Why? Because by definition, by definition, we said that we take a look at bound and below. So if it's, as I said, a subset of S, there exists a beta in this order set, such that it's a lower bound. So if b is bounded below just replace the e with b then there is a something in s such that boom 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 is bounded below so all the elements in l are in s so we have l is bounded above l is subset of s but s has the least upper bound property then combine them gives you that the supremum of L, call it alpha, exists. And we know that alpha is in S. Okay, now we prove the alpha is in S. We want to show that alpha is the least upper bound of of b right so we want to show that first alpha is lower bound of of b which is saying that we want to show that alpha is in l and second we want to show that beta is not lower bound of l if if uh, beta is greater than alpha, right? The definition of lower bound is the greatest lower bound. So if you're greater than the lower bound, if you're greater than the greatest lower bound, then you're not a lower bound. So first, let's take a look at the first one. So we used contrapositive. We wanna show alpha is lower bound of B which means that if alpha, if gamma is in L, that implies alpha is less than or equal to gamma. And the contrapositive of the statement is that if the negation of the statement, remember the negation of the statement here, then we wanna show the negation is if, alpha, if gamma is less than alpha, then that implies the negation of this statement, which is, it's not an L. So we, it's sufficient to sh uh, show that this is true. Then this is true. Then gamma is the lower bound. So, But oh, sorry. The L should be B. It's in B because alpha is the lower bound of B. I'm sorry. Okay. Now we're good. So you want to show if a number is less than alpha. 
then alpha then that if gamma is less than alpha then gamma is not in B. But why? Because if gamma is less than alpha, then since alpha is the least upper bound of L, then gamma is not a upper bound of L. Then we know that there exists K in L such that Y is less than K. But if, since K is the lower bound of B, then it's less than or equal to all the X's such that X is in B. So we know that Y, no, it's gamma. 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 So we have that gamma is not in B. Okay, first step we're done. Second step we have to show that B is not lower bound of L, not lower bound of B. Uh, of B. If beta is greater than alpha. So, first, if <coughs> uh, alpha is less than beta, since, since alpha is upper bound of L, Then we know that for any lower bounds of B, beta is let beta is greater than then. So we said it's obvious that beta cannot be in L. Right? So and the theorem is proved. We have shown one is true, two is true simultaneously, which means that alpha is the infinimum.